Well, good morning. For the last couple of weeks, Pastor John has been talking to us about keeping the main thing the main thing. And this last Sunday, we zeroed in on discipleship as a way of doing that. Pastor John gave us a great definition, which I want to share again with us, just as a reminder. Discipleship is intentionally putting energy into making space for the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and the people of God to help make us more like Jesus. Well, my thoughts immediately turned to the parable of the great banquet in Luke 14, especially as it relates to the intentionality and the making space part of the definition. Luke 14 opens with Jesus teaching in the home of a prominent Pharisee. First, he speaks about the Sabbath, then he speaks about humility, and then later talks, he talks about hospitality to the poor. The parable that follows sets the stage for Jesus' teaching on discipleship and what that really means. Well, as the story goes, a great banquet was being prepared, and it was great in the sense that there were generous provisions and ample room for unlimited guests. The announcement had been made well in advance so that there would be plenty of time for people to uh, build the invitation into their schedule and so they could plan to come. I suppose it would be something like the save the date notices that young couples send out these days ahead of their wedding invitation. Well, at this point in the story, the official word had gone out. The banquet is ready and now it's time to come. My reflections on this story would say that God is the host. The preparation phase would relate to the promise of the Messiah in the Old Testament that weaves its way all through the Jewish sacrificial system. And then the readiness phase would refer to the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus in the New Testament as the means of our coming to faith in him and receiving the blessing of eternal life. Well, the guests may have had full intentions when they first got the invitation, but when the time actually came, other things trumped its importance. All three declined with varying, I would say maybe flimsy excuses. The businessman had bought a field and he was preoccupied with increasing his investment, building his reputation and making a name for himself. The farmer had just purchased five teams of oxen, and he was very anxious to try them out and see if he had made a good purchase. As a working man in a working class, his focus was on things, materialistic gain that would contribute to his sense of success. Well, there was yet another guy, and he had just gotten married. His relationship was what captured his attention. And Deuteronomy 24 provided the rationalization that he needed to feel okay with begging off. The scripture says in Deuteronomy that for one year, a newly married man was exempt from the war or any other duty. He was permitted to stay home for a whole year just to make his wife happy. Sounds like a plan. Well, all three choices that were expressed focused on temporal values rather than eternal values. Now, let me hasten to say that all three excuses focused on good things if they're used properly. But if they're not used as God intends, then they become a hindrance to the kingdom of God. Well, relative to Pastor John's definition of discipleship, in their favor, the responses were intentional. They would made plans, they'd invested energy, they made space, and they were focusing on good things. But sadly, those good things distracted from making the main thing the main thing, with the result that they ended up missing out on the blessing. Bottom line was that none of them truly wanted to give up their own agendas to accept the invitation. You see, God isn't impressed with good activities when they're not done for the right reasons. Have you ever done something that you felt was fairly significant, but then you wondered why the satisfaction seemed shallow or short-lived? Initially, you felt good about what you'd done, but in retrospect, retrospect, you recognize that the good that you felt 
was really your own smugness at what you had done, rather than seeing it as the goodness of God who made it possible for you to be in a place to reach out to someone else in need. Jesus isn't saying that love for family has to diminish, but he is saying that love for him must increase until it becomes uppermost in our lives. He's not saying that an organized life is inappropriate, but he is saying that his plans must take precedence over my personal designs for my life. My plans must be held loosely. Always, they must be subject to his. Well, the text says that the host was angry at the responses to his invitation. He told the servant to give no further notice to, to those seekers of pleasure who were too busy in building their own little kingdom to even think of being bothered with his. The host's response links back to verse 12 earlier in the chapter. It says, if we only invite our friends or our rich relatives or our neighbors who are likely to reciprocate, then they'll miss out on the blessing and so will we because all we're really doing is trading our resources. The host then directs the servant to invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind those who would be least likely to be in a position to be able to buy or marry or work or appraise property. Well, even after the servant followed through with new guests, there was still room. There is always, always, always room for more in the kingdom of God. In fact, there's room for everyone. And the passion of host Jesus is that he would have a full house. Well, the story ends with a stern but loving warning. Not one of the original guests would even get a taste of the blessing. So Jesus then proceeds to exhort everyone who was listening at the time and we who are listening now to make sure that we count the cost. What he's virtually saying is you cannot be my disciple unless I am the main thing in your life, unless you're willing to sacrifice for my sake unless all you are and all you have are put at my disposal for the building of the kingdom. You see, a half-hearted commitment not only cheats you of the blessing that God has for you, but it reflects badly on Jesus. Onlookers will see little difference in a person who calls themselves a Christian or a person who does not. You see, unsalty salt is good for nothing. It's no good as a fertilizer, and it won't even keep the weeds down on a manure pile. It's absolutely useless, good only to be thrown out. Would you agree that for all of us, there are times in our lives when life gets in the way, things get busy, and God kind of gets shifted to the back burner? Well, if now is one of those seasons in your life, or in mine, let's ask ourselves, what's my excuse? What's stopping me from putting God first? What's getting in the way of my relationship with God and putting a barrier between me and his table? Imagery of the table is a way of speaking of our communion with our Heavenly Father. And the choice to sit at the table is made not just one time, but over and over and over again in a daily sense. The beauty of that reality is that if our excuses got in the way yesterday or the day before that, well, today presents a fresh opportunity to say yes and to take a seat at the table. You see, God's grace never runs out. The table, as Pastor John said on Sunday, is a place of transformation. We're changed as we intentionally make space for the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God, and the people of God in our everyday lives. So what does all this mean for us practically? Let's just take pause right now and ask ourselves, how are we responding to the invitation? Maybe some of you are seated at the table right now and enjoying the banquet full on. That's wonderful. But there may be others whose minds are winding backwards to a recent time when you declined the invitation of Jesus. Maybe you were too busy to call an old friend who lives alone or a single mom who needed some help 
or a neighbor who's hospitalized, or you fill in the blank. Did you say, I'm too busy right now? I'll do that another day. Sticky pages here. Well, I want to pray with, for us right now, and as I do, I want to encourage you to join me in renewing our desire and our commitment to discipleship, as Pastor John described it on Sunday. I think this is a good time for us to be reminded of our verse of the year. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Okay, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for the open invitation that you've extended to all of us to sit at your table, to receive your love and forgiveness and be transformed by your power and your presence so that we can do your work in our world. Lord, we can do absolutely nothing apart from your Holy Spirit at work in us. So right now we're asking for your help to be sensitive to the promptings that come from you for us to reach out at every opportunity. When we're tempted to delay or not pay attention or make excuses, remind us of our call to discipleship and our responsibility that comes with it. Father, would you keep us alert this day to your presence and may we show our love for you through our obedience with whatever you ask us to do. We pray all of this in the loving and powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you for showing up this morning or this afternoon or whenever. I'm always uh, delighted to think that there are people out there uh, who are participating by listening in. So I hope you have a great day and uh, special blessings will come your way. Take care. Bye now.